Mr. President, we've now been operating for more than 800 days without a budget having been passed. We are operating at the direction of the party in control of this body on autopilot. It's easy to operate on autopilot. In many ways, it's far easier than operating not on autopilot, especially when we're spending more than $1.5 trillion a year more than we're bringing in, more than $1.5 trillion every year more than we have, continuing to bury our children under a mountain of debt. When you're on autopilot, you don't have the same constraints, the same hard choices, the same prioritization demands that need to be made that Americans make every single day as they manage their homes, their lives, their families, their businesses, and state and local governments. This is unfortunate, it's unnecessary, and it's shameful. It shouldn't continue to operate this way. An enterprise as large as the federal government, which brings in $2.2 trillion every single year, having access to more money than perhaps any other institution on Earth, ought to be able to operate with a budget. It ought to be able to pass a budget. It ought not be operating on autopilot so as to insulate itself from critiques, justifiable and unjustifiable alike, from those who would say, why are you doing it this way? Why are you doing it that way? It ought to have the debate and the discussion that is necessary, that necessarily surrounds the budgeting process in any legislative body, in any republic around the world. In the process of operating on autopilot, we're severely exacerbating our deficit problem with our national debt now totaling nearly $15 trillion. What then is the solution? I believe that the solution to our current problem, especially as we approach the debt limit, involves the cut, cap, and balance approach, including passage by both houses of Congress of the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act, one that would require, in addition to our making immediate short-term cuts and adopting statutory spending caps designed to place us on a firm, smooth glide path toward a balanced budget, that we also pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. All of these would be passed as conditions precedent to our raising the debt limit, which many of us are willing to do, if necessary, to get those measures passed. We're not willing to raise it without those measures first being passed, because we can't continue to perpetuate this problem, one in which we operate on autopilot while burning $1.5 trillion a year that we don't have. This is crowding out other priorities. It's crowding out other investment in our economy. It's killing jobs. And it's jobs that we need to be focused on, because that's what the American people are focused on. They're worried about their ability and the ability of their friends and family members, many of whom are unemployed, to provide for their children to pay their rent, to buy their groceries. These are things that every American ought to be able to have access to and would have access to if only they had access to jobs. But at a time when we are spending at such a rate as we are, when we're, we borrowed to such a degree that we have that our debt to GDP ratio is at about 95%, we're killing as many as a million jobs every single year in America as long as we remain in that danger zone. This simply cannot continue. Another thing that we face right now that's uh, something that I find completely unacceptable is the fact that amidst all this debate and discussion that we've had in recent weeks about the debt limit, amidst the offer on the part of uh, what are now most of the Republicans in the United States Senate to raise the debt limit under the circumstances that I've outlined, the President of the United States responded to those offers by threatening, promising perhaps, to cut Social Security benefits to current retirees if the debt limit is not immediately raised and raised only consistent with the conditions that he's demanding right now. I fail to understand, Mr. President, why the President of the United States would prefer to make so hasty, so cruel, and so reckless a threat as withholding Social Security checks for current retirees before looking at any other federal program. I mean, look, we borrow at a rate of about $125 billion a month. That's a lot of money. A lot of people don't make that much money in a whole year. Now, 
as we're borrowing at that rate, we have to take into account the fact that Social Security benefits cost the U.S. Treasury about $50 billion a month. That's 50 out of the $125 billion each month that we borrow, assuming that that's the portion of it that's borrowed. Meanwhile, we're bringing in about $200 billion a month in tax revenue. So there's more than enough tax revenue there to cover not only Social Security benefits, but also interest on debt and a number of other things well, as well. That begs the question, why are Social Security beneficiaries the first to be threatened? Why is it their checks that the President is threatening to withhold first? There is no explanation to this that he's offered, and I hereby demand one. I think our current retirees deserve more than to be used as pawns in a high-stakes political game, one that uses fear and uncertainty and doubt rather than reason and discussion and debate and willingness to compromise. The need for this has never been greater. The consequences for disregarding the need for debate and discussion have never been higher. I urge my colleagues and I urge all Americans to work together to find a solution to this, a solution that need not involve and should not involve threatening America's most vulnerable, including her retirees who rely each month on Social Security, with withholding those benefits simply because the President of the United States is unwilling to compromise, is unwilling to meet the conditions that many Republicans in this body have uh, acknowledged are their conditions, precedent for raising the debt limit. There is a way forward. There is a road that will take us home. And the road home can be found in the Cut, Cap, and Balance Act. This is not just the best proposal. This is the only proposal that currently has significant public support from a substantial number of members of this body. Sometime today or tomorrow, companion legislation will be introduced in the House of Representatives, and it will be moving forward. I urge my colleagues to carefully consider this, and I urge my fellow Americans to carefully consider these and to urge their representatives and their senators to embrace them and to adopt them. Thank you very much. Mr. President. Senator from Alabama. I thank Senator Lee for his uh, leadership on this uh, cut, cap, and balance plan. I think it would change the debt trajectory of our country and put us on the pro uh, path to prosperity rather than the um, path to decline and deficit and maybe financial crisis. And the whole process is a able to be pursued without public knowledge and full disclosure <clears throat> when you don't have a budget. Every president is required by the same Budget Act to submit a budget. I, I think there's no president who's failed to comply with a Budget Act. It does not require that you go, go to jail if you violate it. Probably we'd be better off had that been the case. Uh, but the president submitted a budget early this year, I think in February. It was, I believe, the most irresponsible budget ever presented to Congress. Why didn't Senator Reid and the Democratic leadership decide to bring a budget out? Well, if you bring a budget, then you have to show what you believe. You have to propose a solution to the problem. What was their plan? To call up the House budget and vote it down, as every Democrat voted it down, and they never produced one of their own. Well, when I brought up President Obama's budget, they voted it down. So we've not seen one real solution. We have them talking about, oh, they'll do this and that. Senator Durbin said, we can change Social Security some and get it on a, a sound. We can do something about Medicare. Well, let's see your plan. Let's see it. Chairman of the Budget Committee says he has a budget. He's, he's got a budget. He leaks out portions of it. Um, uh, but nobody sees the real budget. There's certain numbers and visions and ideas, and he claims they have a budget. But if you're unwilling to produce the budget and have a hearing uh, in the uh, budget committee, then you don't have one 